uh, going to join me in a short while. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, I hope it's uh, at sunny where you are. It's, it's lovely and sunny here in just, just outside of uh, Arnold in Nottinghamshire. Uh, so I'm hoping that that sunshine is, is casting itself all across uh, Nottinghamshire, Bassetlaw and, and Bolsover and other aspects of uh, other parts of the uh, of the uh, the area that, you, that you're based in. Um, such a great turnout as well. Uh, really good to see uh, so many uh, new names and new organisations. And both Heather and I are really looking forward to this morning's session, getting to know you all. Uh, having a good chat with you uh, and sharing experiences. As Andrea has just said, um, bid writing isn't an exact science. Um, I'm going to introduce my background into bid writing and funding in a short while, but I hasten to say uh, I'm, I, I've got lots of experience, but uh, I wouldn't say I'm an out and out expert. I think we're all learning. We're all on a journey of learning as the context for funding and commissioning and bid writing is always changing. I think that's an important uh, point to make, but you know, you're all, all very welcome today. It's good to see you here. Um, let me just make sure, everybody hold on, I'm going to make sure I can share my screen. This is always the uh, exciting bit at the start of an online meeting that we've got the technology all working correctly. Um, can you all see that? Yes, yes, <clears throat> good. Oh, good. Great. That's the first objective done. It's always a, a great feeling. Um, so just a little bit about who we are, uh, and then there's going to be some really important time uh, shortly uh, where you can introduce yourselves to. Um, so I'm the managing director of a, of a consultancy organisation called Blink Bright. Uh, like I said, uh, I'm based and we're based in Nottinghamshire. We work across the county and the region and at times across the country. Um, I would say primarily our work focus is supporting um, the um, delivery uh, organisations of voluntary uh, community uh, sector uh, across the area. We do a lot of work with uh, with local government, uh, local authorities too, uh, and occasionally for, for national uh, organisations and national uh, government. Um, we do a lot of work around evaluation of delivery, uh, but we also do uh, work around supporting organisations to become more strategic, to look at their development, including their sustainability and their finances uh, overall. Um, and I've got a bit of a mixed background. I, I spent many years working in the, uh, in the civil service. Uh, I was part of the Department for Education and Employment in the 90s uh, and then that turned it for me my journey went into the Department for Work and Pensions when DWP first came along. Uh, I then moved into Job Centre Plus uh, and I started off nationally uh, working on very large employment and training programmes and commissioning programmes uh, and eventually ended up in a more localised role when I was Head of External Relations for Nottinghamshire. Uh, and back in the day, uh, I used to commission the voluntary sector locally with a whole range of outreach uh, and community support um, packages linked to helping people move into uh, economic inclusion and address uh, economic deprivation. Uh, I would say over the last 10 years or so, uh, my role has changed a little bit more to do with funding. Uh, I started off in my career uh, designing policy and designing programs and being that side of the table where I was scrutinising um, funding applications and bids uh, and going through that tendering process. And then more recently, over the last 10 years or so, uh, I've applied for funding, uh, which has been a, an interesting uh, shift in my experience where I've had to uh, work with organisations or directly myself for my company uh, and bid to commissioning organisations and work out the uh, the solution, think critically and work out the solution uh, to uh, to address uh, funding requirements uh, and uh, and meet those uh, those criteria for successful funding outcomes. And you know, it's not always been a success. At times, and many times, uh, I've been unsuccessful both in partnership environments and uh, through my company bidding for work doesn't always work out as you want it to. And I, I appreciate we've probably all got experiences of that and, and the frustrations that that brings. But one thing I would say that's important to uh, uh, think about 
in all of this is, is, is objective thinking, um, both in terms of how you approach uh, a, a bid uh, when you put together a, a proposal and an application, uh, looking objectively about the, the requirement and how you can meet that requirement through the solution, but also learning from experience if you don't quite achieve uh, what they're looking for. Um, and that's a hard thing to do because uh, it's quite easily easy to become quite uh, emotive with your thinking when you don't succeed. Uh, I've learned from this experience, like I say, and you know, a really important lesson point for me has been to look at it critically and objectively, think through the reasons why, and obviously ask for feedback, but think through the reasons why I was unsuccessful and take that learning experience into the, the, the next the next uh, the next task. Um, so that, that learning experience, like I say, is, is, is a really important point, I think, overall, as we explore uh, the, uh, the bid writing environment in today's session. Um, so just briefly, then, I'm going to hand over to Heather, who's uh, your other facilitator for today, my uh, very close working colleague. Uh, we share a lot of our work together um, and somebody that I've known and worked with very closely over the last almost two decades. Heather, over to you. Thanks, David. Um, uh, yeah, I was just reflecting on how long how long that was. So yeah, it is it is nearly two decades. Um, my um, my experience um, in some ways mirrors David. I um, I've also read and written a lot of bids over the years. Um, my background um, spent some time uh, in local government. Spent some time in one of the um, accountancy-based management consultancies, um, and I've also spent some time as a civil servant, um, which did involve looking at um, an awful lot of funding bids, um, including many from the voluntary and community sectors. So um, I I have also sat very much both sides of the fence. I think my immediate reflections, and we'll come into come on to this in, in today's um, uh, discussions, is that bid writing's actually changed quite a lot over that time. Uh, there was a time when you were expected to produce war and peace, um, and um, the more detail you had in bids, the better. Um, what I've noticed, as is the case in, in so much of our written word these days, is that um, it's now all about putting things together in as succinct a way as possible. And, and word count is often very much um, driving what you are saying. So the ability to put things together um, uh, in a succinct and meaningful way has, has become extremely important um, today. So um, I, I also, um, when David was talking, was thinking if I'd been a much more organised person, I would have um, documented my strike rate in terms of um, bids that I've submitted and whether they've been successful or not. And I haven't. Uh, there may be some uh, some of you out there who are very organised, who who do have that information. It is very, very useful to reflect on, you know, what has worked and why it has worked um, and, and to use that to inform any uh, type of application that you're doing moving forward. So, um, uh, so learning point one for me this morning to be a bit more systematic about uh, documenting whether I've been successful in, in bidding for things. But um, we'll move on into the agenda now and I'll just hand back to David, um, who, who's going to take you through that. OK, thanks, Heather. Um, so today's session is about bid writing. Hopefully you're in the right meeting. <laughs> um, we're going to run through to around 12.30 with a, with a break uh, approximately around 10.45-ish. Uh, we'll see how we, how we do with that, but we, you know, we're conscious that uh, it's always good to have a, a stretch our legs halfway through these kind of sessions. Um, in a short while, uh, I'm going to open this up and we're going to cover some intros around the virtual room. It's really good to find out who, who you all are and, and where you're from and what you're doing. Um, and indeed, actually, that's a theme that we want to uh, really uh, support throughout the morning, sharing experience. Um, again, going back to, to Andrea's uh, introduction, uh, it may be that uh, some of you are bid writing gurus uh, and, and are very happy to open up and share your experience of uh, what you do. And for others, 
it may be a new role, a relatively new organisation, or a new set of, uh, of challenges uh, for your for your strategic direction that requires you to uh, approach bid writing and and funding in, in a different manner. Uh, so this is new territory for you. So I think the more that we can as as a group uh, share that experience, the better we're all going to benefit uh, in terms of the learning outcomes from 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 today. Uh, really, the heart of the session is is going through how we um, plan and prepare and solutionize, if that's a word, uh, the approach towards bid writing, uh, looking at uh, the, the whole process around how best to form a bidding structure, uh, design a methodology, uh, address the aims and priorities with a specification uh, through to how best to cost, uh, what information uh, is, is required in support of a, of a bid uh, and what that means in terms of, uh, of you individually in your roles and organisationally, strategically and developmentally for how you can position yourselves to, uh, to uh, increase the, uh, the effectiveness of applying for funding and obviously the, the, you know, the chances of a, of a positive uh, outcome for you. Um, clearly, this is a key priority. Sustainability um, is 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 key. Uh, it's times are tough, as we all know. You know, it's it's tough, particularly for uh, for uh, public services, uh, for uh, the VCS in general. Um, there's disparity around how that affects some areas more than others. Uh, I'm sure some of you ex have experienced that there's been a huge reduction uh, in um, uh, locally commissioned and uh, local authority uh, funded uh, community grant based activity over the last decade. Uh, so you know, we appreciate uh, just how challenging the, uh, the fiscal environment is uh, for, for everyone. Uh, so you know, the more that we can do to um, encourage you to address bid writing um, critically, objectively, to learn new ideas and skills, uh, the better really uh, builds our resilience as a sector and that's really important isn't it i think in terms of the the overall aims of, of where we're going today and it could be that um this is just start of the journey and hopefully it will be i mean andrea has set the, the the scene at the start uh we have other bcbs staff in the room very welcome to, to, to see to see them too uh and uh your feedback today uh really will inform where we go next and how we can support and, uh, and drive forward uh, the resilience of the sector overall. Um, we'll come to some of that uh, obviously later on in terms of the detail uh, and then reflect on the lessons learned at the end. But uh, I think really what would be useful next is to uh, uh, spend some time uh, getting to know uh, who's who's in the room. Um, and um, I'm not going to, I hate picking on people, but uh, it'd be good if we have a, a volunteer to kick this off. But what we've uh, got here are just some, 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 some tips really about what we can cover in the next uh, 10 minutes or so. Uh, it'd be good to know your experience around, around funding, um, particularly in the last two years. As Heather was saying, the context is always changing. Uh, you know, we're in that sort of, in theory, we're in a post-pandemic recovery phase. It doesn't always feel like it at the moment, but uh, you know, the, the, the main theme, uh, one of the key themes uh, rather over the last couple of years has been around uh, keeping things going, um, uh, sustainability in the context of COVID and uh, addressing that through the various funding streams that have, have been available to us. Uh, so any experience you have around that will be great to hear. Uh, so who you are, your organisation, your background, like I said, the experience you have around funding and bid writing. Um, what various flavours you have of that type of organisations you bid to and the outcomes that you've uh, uh, you've experienced. Uh, it'd be good to open that up and that will then help uh, take the conversation forward through the rest of the morning. So um, without further ado, any volunteers to go first with the intro? You can either dive in there or raise a hand. I don't mind how you want to do it. Stunned silence, David. Oh, yeah. you might <laughs> I think I've got a hand. I don't mind going. I don't mind going first. Okay, then was that was that Harry that said that? It is, yeah. Hi. <laughs> yeah, and then I saw jo Joanne. You put your hand up. You put your real hand up. So we'll go to jo Joanne after that. Go on then. Kick off. Kick okay. 
I'm only willing to go first because it's very short. I've got to say, so I've only ever written one bit. <laughs> okay, that's fine. <laughs> I'm from I'm from Muddy Fork. Uh, we're a mental health charity in Redford, a small mental health charity, and we find it hard to find core costs. So we're always looking to bid for core costs. So I'm trying to learn on my feet. So everything today will be very useful. So thank you. <laughs> very welcome. Um, so when you say one bit, is that for the organisation or was that just in your role? Is that something new for you? Uh, not the organisation I've bid previous to me, but uh, one bid for me, which was successful, actually. So that's 100 <laughs> percent. Fantastic. That's great. I think you can take us through the rest of the day then. I mean, uh, that's, that's a 100 percent result. <laughs> great. Thank you. Um, Joanne. I think you had your hand up, didn't you? Morning, uh, I'm Jo, um, so I'm a service manager for um, Bassett Law's Royal, Royal Voluntary Service. So I manage the um, <clears throat> the home from hospital and uh, discharge medicine delivery service across Bassett Law. Um, I've not had a lot of experience in bid writing. We do have within the organisation with us being a national charity. We do have people who do the, the large bids to the, the CCGs and things for um, for the commission services like like I manage, but um, I have done uh, two bids before, for one for um, co-ops local community grant and for um, Tesco's community grant as well and managed to get both of those. That was just for, you know, small amounts really just to help with uh, with services locally. So, but that's about it. Brilliant. Thank, thanks, Joe. So did I take that was also a 100 percent record for you, both bids being successful. It's great. Well done. Yeah. And that's that's interesting. That point you made around uh, national organisations will often have a, a kind of corporate role, won't they, around business development and, and, and bidding and, and, and funding, uh, which is great if you can draw from that experience and benefit locally. But then, you know, it's also challenging if you're a, a local uh, VCSE organisation uh, coming up against in competition with those kind of uh, national uh, to local approaches. Um, so it's just those sort of dynamics uh, that we all have to be aware of. Something Sometimes we can control this and sometimes it's beyond our control and we have to go through that learning experience again with the outcome. OK, who would like to go next? Don't be shy. Lauren, I've got a hand up from Lauren. Um, oh, there we go. My camera's on now. Hello, um, I'm from I'm Lauren from the School of Artisan Food um, and working on the Best Food Forward project. Um, and I've got Joe in the room with me. Um, I'm a dietitian. Joe's a dietitian in training, um, and I'm quite new to the bid the, the bidding process. Um, come out of the NHS beforehand, where it sort of well money was as scarce as you can imagine so um um there were other formalities i suppose um but i've had to um like someone said earlier learn on my feet with the, the bidding process um i've written actually a few in the past six months um so um one was successful um with the help of um so with with a other body the food and drink forum um and that was quite formal, um, but I was actually quite surprised at how informal some of them have been. Um, so I suppose it's not something we would necessarily, well, I wasn't trained in at university really at all, um, because you're sort of geared up for work in the NHS, but working now in the charitable sector, um, yes, definite need for it. So yeah, really echo what someone said earlier, I really appreciate this opportunity to, to learn how to go about doing that, hopefully. Um, so yeah, one was successful, one was looking to be really successful and then just fell on its face. Um, and then two are still in progress um, for smaller amounts of money. But um, yeah, I suppose it's that constant need, especially with, with the cost of food and everything. So um, yeah, hopefully I'll be upskilled and more successful like the rest of you. That's great. Thanks, Lauren, and uh, and hi to Joe as well. Um, yeah, another great point. I think um, that, that there's real variation in terms of what's required in terms of the 
the overall format of the response uh, that we need to give through through bid writing, isn't there? And you know, um, some have improved, and we you know that allows for us to be quite concise and and, and be able to summarise a, a solution and a methodology and approach. But some can be just really really heavy and have pages and pages and pages of description required, which uh, I hate those most of all. I think really, uh, so it can be certainly very painful at times. But I, th I suppose really it's about being adaptable, isn't it? And understanding that we have to go through that process of understanding the uh, the format, the style, uh, the structure of the of the response. And that's just that's part of the game that we have to play. Um, Anita. Hi, good morning. I'm Anita Olorenshaw. I'm the manager over at um, Rhubarb Farm. As an organisation, we've been quite successful with funding over the years, um, since 2009. And that's thanks to our MD, Jenny, who spends 40 hours a week just looking uh, for funding and, and putting in applications. Um, but, you know, we need to carry on from, from Jenny, who wants to slow down a little bit now. I've not got a lot of experience with bid writing personally. I have done quite a few small bids that I've been successful with, and um, but it's the bigger the bigger bids for the core funding to pay our salaries, etc. That that frighten me a little bit, to be honest. Um, and we have got an application to prepare to national lottery. We're three and a half years into a five year funding, and um, and without without that support going forward for the the consecutive five years it's it, you know it's it's difficult to imagine how rubber farm would continue um so it's important that we you know we do get it right so i'm here to learn i'm here to learn you know different methods and strategies for the for the bigger bids really right thank you Anita. that's just an interesting point as well around um it can be quite a lonely role at times can't it when we're uh, if we if we are specifically uh, working on on, on funding and, and bid writing, and uh, I've come across very often um, uh, a VCS organisation where it has really rested with the chief exec to, um, to, to to sort of solely focus on uh, funding applications, and that's understandable when uh, you know you need to prioritise your organisational time and capacity for delivery. Um, but in my experience, the more you can look at it collectively, if you have the benefit of working in a in a, in a bigger team. Um, the better the, the the final, the chances, the better the final um, solution can be. Uh, particularly when you sort of review where you are, uh, you understand how the the funding opportunity can support your your strategic aims, and you share that experience as a, as a team. That all helps the uh, the bid writing process. Uh, so I think it's getting that balance right, uh, like you're doing, Anita, around understanding the pressures individually on on key people in the team, but also thinking uh, on an ongoing basis. Uh, in terms of continuity and, and shared experience. Um, Matt. Morning, everybody. Thank you, David. Uh, my name is Matt Pearson. I'm uh, the co-founder of workshop-based charity, Joel, and we support families through pregnancy and parenting after baby loss. Um, we're 10 years old as an organisation. Uh, we celebrated our birthday uh, in September. Um, and my role sort of slightly changed, hence why I'm on this training this morning. So I'm going to be kind of more involved in bid writing and looking to secure funding for that sustainability, but also to, to help us maintain that support that we have. And we, we support families all, all across um, the United Kingdom and further afield with our resources, but also the projects around and we've just in fact I'm, I'm probably doing myself um, an injustice there I actually wrote a funding bid over the summer and was successful in um, in achieving some uh, some money to help us reduce isolation post-covid and looking at skills for life and working with our families to help them move forward with um, you know with, with with work and life but in particular through um, baby loss and parenting after loss so I'm here really to to really kind of look at the ins and outs of of how to write successful funding bids and applications and, and also network with others that might be in a similar situation um, and yeah thanks for having me. Hi, very welcome Matt I mean I I, I imagine through through your role and the role of the organisation you have to 
you, you have to be very sort of broad with what's going on. You kind of radar out there in terms of where the funding opportunities are and where the policy is changing uh, must be uh, must be a challenge in itself. Uh, I, I wouldn't thought. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. And, and as I say, I'm, I'm relatively new to this. We, we have um, had successful funding bids that we've secured, um, you know, a good few years ago. But post pandemic, looking at that sustainability, that kind of shift in agenda around isolation, but trying to, I don't know, pick, pick ourselves back up after maybe laying a little bit stagnant over that couple of years um, and, and seeing what's out there really to, to, to move forward. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Anita, is that your hand from when you spoke? Is that a new hand? Is that a legacy hand we've got there? Brilliant. Uh, so, Andrea. Hi, um, I thought I'd share my experience and our team's experience, but also just to plug a couple of other opportunities to help build your capacity and skills in this space. Um, I've been gamekeeper and poacher. Um, we're now poacher, I guess, on that side of the fence. But it's it's certainly very useful to be a commissioner and understand the mindset and and the considerations they have um, from from millions of pounds scale to a few thousand. So kind of all all ends of the spectrum. Um, and between us at BCVS, we've probably got hundreds of years of bid writing experience. So, and we're here to help you and, and, and advise you. We can't write bids for you, but we can help you. So another couple of uh, things we've got coming up that I just wanted to flag with you because I do think it adds value here is we're offering some free, um, well, funded by BCVS project management training. And it's very useful um, in bid writing as well, both the discipline, but also the answers that you will understand that will score better in those kind of questions. And then the other thing I just wanted to flag is I've noticed as um, the years have gone by, and particularly in recent years, the turnaround times for bids are getting shorter and shorter. So the need to be pre-prepared and have all of that thinking and prep work done is greater now than ever getting ridiculous a matter of weeks sometimes rather than months till launch of a fund till close of the deadline so that's just what i wanted to share really we all we all know that that's why we're here to prepare but there's other support we can provide as well brilliant thanks andrea i whenever i i, I do a, a bid that requires a response around how the the service we're bidding to deliver the the, the, the role uh, is going to be managed. I always use a project management based approach. Um, I've got some training in Prince Two, uh, which is one of the project management um, disciplines, and I always apply a bit of that to uh, the explanation of how the project will be managed. So I, I couldn't recommend enough an opportunity to have a session on on, on project management. That would be really, really great. And I think it would really complement uh, this session. So I really, really would recommend that out to to your uh, your VCS locally. Thank you. Um, Just to qualify, it's not Prince2. It, it will draw on various uh, tools. I'm a practitioner too, so I share your pain there, <laughs> the joy and pain of Prince2 practitioners. It'll draw on a bit of Prince, a bit of APM, and, and take the best bits of all of it. Right, that, sounds that sounds brilliant. Lucy. I, I quickly, because obviously um, Andrew's my boss and I don't want to dominate, but it was just to say that the, the range that we support, um, interesting over the last two years, I was thinking the last two weeks, but our, our biggest success, but it, it's we have massive bids from uh, reaching communities. The biggest one was uh, three, 375,000 over three years. And then in the last couple of weeks, and, and what well, like Andrew's saying, I often get asked to read through and just to comment and add a bit of confidence. Um, but it's it's really great to to see the variety of projects that people are putting in for. And the last week it was a a second stage again reaching communities bid, but this time for seventy k. But it just reminds me how much effort people have to put in. Yeah. You know, it's just massive, right down to the smallest ones where we've I've helped a group put in for a community fridge. So that's the hub of trust, and then Derbyshire County Council. And uh, but there's there's just such a range, isn't there? There isn't one standard way of applying for a fund. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, no, yeah, spot on, Lucy. Yeah, there isn't, you know, you've got to be really adapted to uh, to the requirements and the, the context, uh, the, the policy, uh, everything that's changing all the time and the formats are always changing. Um, thank you, Marzina. 
if you're on mute, I'll see you. Good morning. Um, so I'm quite new to my job role and I've been appointed as Basel Eastern European and Ethnic Minority Group Development Officer in July. Um, I've never applied for um, funding. I mean, I've got a very, um, very small experience because I've been running for seven years um, Language Cafe Group. So I applied twice, but it was a small funding and I was successful, but I haven't got experience in um, in writing a, a big uh, funding bits. So I'm just hoping to get some guidance and tips so I could support the, um, the wider community. Um, and I've been able to... Um, to establish one group, uh, and I'm in the process of establishing two ethnic minority groups um, currently. Um, so I'm just uh, hopeful that you know this um, this session will enable me to provide uh, useful support for the groups, um, and to be able to reduce isolation and uh, promote cohesion. I've managed to secure uh, so far two volunteers and they've been running regular sessions now, but hopefully in the future, you know, um, should the group wish to require um, provide any other sessions, you know, I would be able to support them in this. That's great. Uh, well, thanks, Monzina. It's really interesting to hear about the developments you've got going on at BCBS and I'm sure very welcome um, locally. Um, anybody else like to have a go at introducing themselves? Hi, I'll go next if you want. I'm coming up as Isba, so we've got yeah. issues with my, <laughs> my name's Jade. Um, I'm from Sale in Chesterfield. We cover the county around sexual abuse, incest um, and survivors really supporting them. So my role now, I've known to Sale, I've worked for Sale before, but it is a new role. Um, and it's um, advocacy and service development manager. So I've not really had much um, experience in bidding. Um, fortunately, I've never written bids as such. I've kind of given information for them around impact and help build that because I've worked across different charities right through from CSE to domestic abuse over the last 16 years and substance misuse. So really today is coming to gain skills um, and upskill. Um, because prior to that, um, a bit like Anita really at, Ru at Rhubarb, Ruth does all our funding bids and it's to take that pressure off and support her because we have various, like in other charities I've worked for, funding pots. So we do have ICB recently funding, but different projects within us, within our team come from MOJ, um, OPC and things like that. So it's all different funding. It's just to kind of upskill on that because, as I said, my experience is quite limited. I've kind of just participated in providing evidence um, and yeah, providing the information and solutions of what we're trying to do rather than actually writing. So I'm hoping to gain gain lots of skills this morning. So thank you. Thanks, Jade. That's that's great. Great to hear about the role. Um, I appreciate you don't have the experience, but you have fresh perspective, uh, which is really important, especially with the mixture of uh, of roles and experiences in the room. Um, Anne. Hello, can you hear me all right? Yeah, you great. Good. Um, my background is in primary education. I worked in primary education for about 35 years and I've been retired for almost 15 now. Um, I'm doing some work on behalf of two local churches. Um, we got we started to get involved in, in the community with the um, food um, delivery and uh, support for um, families <clears throat> in overcoming hardship during COVID and uh, our project is growing now. We do food deliveries to about 20 families on a twice weekly basis. Um, and we're also trying to look at the, uh, the energy problem now and open up our buildings to um, support people during this difficult time where they can go in and uh, get, keep warm and uh, have uh, something to eat. Um, so uh, it's a very new, um, the bid writing for me is very new. I've done it just for a few months now, um, put three bids in and got one of them accepted. Um, but uh, really coming for advice on how to write a good bid. Great, great. Again, um, very welcome. And uh, uh, it's interesting to hear about your role and obviously best of luck 
really, you know, really challenging environment for you. All those pressures you have uh, around the buildings in particular and the community you're supporting. Um, Fiona. Morning, everybody. I work for the National Kidney Federation, which is a charity to support kidney patients across the whole of the UK. Um, we're a small charity, although we're national, there's only eight of us that work here. And I've taken on the role of uh, writing for grants in the last year. So I've taken on a database uh, from my predecessor, where there's probably about 500 plus on our database. And it was writing for just asking for donations. Uh, so from training that I've been on, I've discovered I need to ask a figure. So I, I stopped that three thousand um, pounds. And if they want to give, less to do. So since January, I've been successful at just short of fifty thousand. Um, but I did get a big grant from the postcode paper blocker. So that was interesting um, because you get three chances to apply for that. And I phoned them up to see where I was going wrong when I was first applying. So I tried again and tried again and was successful on the third time. So I'm learning as I go. And the begging letter that I was given when I took on the role, I've changed using questions from, you know, when you do online applications and you ask all these questions, I've, I've put those in my covering lesson I think they're more successful when I send the letters off. Um, I've built a portfolio of who I have written to and who I've been successful with. So I know to send them an impact report when the year's up so I can write again to them and ask for more money. So I've got a, a spreadsheet in place for that really. I know there's software out there that you can sign up to but it's just as easy to do a spreadsheet. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Fiona. Um, some, some good points, some interesting things I'm sure we can discuss, uh, discuss throughout the, the day, whether we've got any tips, uh, ideas around uh, software and tools that best help you know, bring this sort of package we need to pull together for bid writing. Um, and also, you, know, you mentioned a donation too, and how that links into the bigger conversation around funding strategy, uh, alongside you know pushing out bid writings per se. So that's that's something else we can uh, think about moving forward. Okay, so I've got guest number three two three. I'm sure your name isn't three two three, uh, but very welcome. If you'd like to introduce yourself. We've got no audio. Not on mute, but yeah, try that again. Try coming off mute. No, sorry, I don't think we can hear you. Can anybody else hear? No. 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 OK, well, so let's move on. Very sorry yeah. that you've not had the opportunity, but if you, you're very welcome to uh, in the chat, uh, just, uh, you know, if you can introduce yourself, it'd be great just to uh, learn uh, briefly about who you are and your background and hopefully if you do uh, get through the audio we can uh, we can have a uh, an audio conversation with you too as we progress. Is, is there anybody else uh, that would like to introduce themselves that hasn't done so so far before we move on? I've got legacy hands up by Marzina and Fiona. Anybody else? Okay. Right okay that's great I mean but people are very welcome to uh, you know, keep that conversation going in the chat as we move forward. But I am conscious of time, uh, so I think we, we do need to crack on. Um, well, thank you for that. And it really is a great thing that we've got this uh, mixture of experience. Uh, you know, genuinely, uh, some of you uh, have uh, you know, a, a, a good track record and have those experiences of success and, 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 and not quite getting there. I'm not going to say failure, that sounds a bit... Uh, final, but the you know the other experience of not not actually getting to the, the finish line. Some of you in the new, and I think that's important too that you've got a fresh perspective that we can uh, help uh, support and grow. Um, just a couple of slides on context uh, before I hand over to uh, to Heather. And that's something that um, we um, are aware of that happens should happen every year. Doesn't always happen every year because. 
the actual um, development of the uh, of the surveying and the intelligence is in itself um, uh, dependent upon funding that comes uh, usually from uh, a local authority. Uh, but what traditionally has happened to support the sector, the VCS over the years, has been a, uh, a state of the sector report. Uh, it happens in most areas across the country. Uh, usually happens down to a local authority at a sort of county authority level. Uh, and uh, Heather and I uh, have been involved in supporting the Nottinghamshire State of the Sector uh, survey report uh, and findings uh, for this year, and then um, provide some additional support for, for Andrea and the team uh, to reflect on survey findings for Bassett Law and actually for Bolsover too, uh, which is a fairly recent intel. Uh, and over a series of, of questions that get sent out uh, to the sector, and I'm sure some of you have actually been involved in responding to, to those surveys. Uh, a number of themes are um, inquired about uh, linked to the state of the sector. Uh, and they range from looking at the uh, demographics of the sector, understanding the types of organisation, their size, their nature, their turnover, the areas that they deliver in and their priorities, all the way through to the challenges, the issues and challenges they face now and moving forward that they can see over the, uh, the coming months and years. And it's really rich information uh, uh, which, uh, which can be put together uh, to really prioritise support such as this. In fact, I know from the work that we've had uh, supporting Andrea uh, and and partners that uh, uh, funding, bid writing, sustainability were some of the key issues that came through the uh, the Bassett Law State of the Sector uh, survey, and actually the Bolsover one too. But the, the couple of charts we've got here uh, relate to, to to Bassett Law. Uh, so informing the the planning and the strategic support all comes from this uh, this exercise. It's just not. Uh, not just about filling in a survey, it's actually about doing something with the uh, the intelligence that comes back. Uh, what you can see here is, uh, I mean, it may be difficult to read on the slide, there's, there's lots of um, lots of bars on the go, but it, it's just illustrating the diversity of funding at uh, any one time. Uh, and I think I've uh, picked that up from your introductions, just the, the areas that you, you reach out to and explore uh, in terms of how best to address your funding needs. Uh, but what the, this chart is telling us that over the last 12 months or so there's predominantly been funding uh, open to the VCS locally across Bassett Law that's come from local authorities uh, either directly the most popular one has been through Bassett Law uh, District Council uh, and then also Nottinghamshire County Council um, and alongside that has been funding nationally and again, some of you covered this in your intros from the National Lottery uh, and the uh, in, in particular, which will come to the next slide, the uh, uh, the Coronavirus Community Support Fund, uh, which really helped to keep services going during the, uh, uh, the second stages of the, uh, of the of the pandemic and also funding from uh, the NHS through the Clinical Commissioning Group, which is a, you know, is a, is a, is a, is a changing context. Uh, locally and nationally, uh, but are at times key commissioners, and I know that BCVS have a very clear and uh, influential role within that um, commissioning and uh, delivery environment around uh, health and social care uh, support. Um, but you know, like I said, it's it's a real mixed picture. It's national, it's regional, it's local. Uh, in the past, it's been European. That's that's changing. Um, big signature programmes uh, promised around levelling up and community renewal. Uh, but goodness knows where that's going now after the week or two we've had with, uh, uh, with, with, the, with, the, with the budget uh, uh, journey that the country's been on. Uh, so what does all this mean uh, for you? Well, it really goes back to the to the conversation we've just had uh, where we just have to um, have to match the, um, the, the the aims, the objectives, uh, the present timing, the operational timing that we have organisationally to the funding opportunities. It's really important to get that match right because quite quickly if you don't and you're bidding for uh, funding that doesn't match where you are and what you're about, your, in my experience, your bid will come, uh, will, will come unstuck. It will start to uh, become a very challenging uh, bid to, uh, to, to, to put together. Uh, so, you know, part of the trick and one of the tips is to understand the uh, the link, the match, the association between what's out there uh, locally or nationally, 
and how that works for you now and works for you in terms of your strategy moving forward. Um, the next chart is just a pie here, uh, which is uh, a spotlight on the, the COVID-19 funding sources over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, it's dominated everything um, it, that was reflected in the in the state of the sector report findings. Um, the uh, coronavirus coronavirus community support fund, uh, forty percent there is, is the biggest slice of funding that uh, local organisations said they accessed uh, during um, that sort of twenty 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 one period that they informed the survey, uh, which was done late last year. Um, and I know from the work that we've done in uh, assessing some of that work and evaluating it for other areas, uh, just how important it's been uh, to keep um, services open, going, uh, staff in position, uh, realise it's, it's been uh, uh, extremely challenging and not always uh, successful for some organisations, but it has been there to underpin uh, and it has really dominated the, uh, the funding landscape over, over, like I said, over the last 18, month, 18 months or so. OK, so um, I'm going to hand you over to Heather now. Um, that was just a bit of context. Uh, you can actually, I, I believe, Andrea, uh, that you can actually access the full state of the sector for Bassett Law and hopefully for Bolsover through the BCBS uh, website. Um, but if not, we can also point you in the direction of it uh, through our lines too, uh, which we can leave a note in the chat later on. Heather. Thanks, David. Um, I'm going to run us through um, uh, a little bit now um, and take us up to um, having a break um, in about I don't know, 20 minutes, half an hour or so. Um, but uh, what I wanted to do really was to um, take us back to that starting point of knowing your audience, how and um, where, how are, are you up? What does that mean? Ooh, right, OK, fine. <laughs> right. Fine, lovely. So uh, where and how are funding opportunities identified? Where are you um, looking, uh, horizon scanning for? Um, bidding opportunities. Um, some of that might be um, at a very local level. Uh, some of that might actually be um, through national procurement platforms. Um, some of it might be coming out through um, local uh, newsletters. Some of it might be um, through your um, contacts, your service delivery contacts. So a bit of a reflection on where and how those bidding opportunities um, present themselves. Um, in, in my world, generally, um, they're either through um, particular um, uh, bidding opportunity platforms uh, that, that I've registered with or through uh, contacts that are actually putting uh, a proposal out and, and you're simply invited to tender your part of a, a, a tendering list. But I, equally, I appreciate that if you're writing a bid to a particular uh, community fund, then there are, there are particular time slots time timed um, uh, time frames where those bidding opportunities open you can bid whatever it is you know once a quarter or once every six months or in some instances sadly only once a year so it's 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 how and when are those bidding opportunities identified I mean a couple of you have already talked about you know national lottery bidding processes and the timings involved in those and the amount of work that it takes to uh, to to get to those so uh, we'll come on to a little bit around that so um are things on an open tender basis or is it some sort of restricted procurement process or have you been invited 
to submit. Uh, again, I think a couple of you have mentioned um, uh, accessing NHS funding um, and um, NHS bit of an alphabet soup and never <laughs> an ever changing alphabet soup, but um, currently commissioning being done by integrated care boards. Um, so uh, again, you might be invited to um, uh, to to bid. Um, so again, just reflecting on on how those opportunities manifest themselves. Time frames. Um, I think it was Andrea who mentioned that the time frames have have got ever shorter, and and those are absolutely something that need to be planned for. Um, both both in terms of the actual development of the bid, the practicalities of writing the bid, and then the practicalities of submitting the bid. So time frames very, very important to think through. Um, uh, I'm conscious I'm being recorded, but it's um, <laughs> it's 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 sod's, sod's law that time frames for bids, in my experience, they'll always pop out uh, just as you're heading into peak holiday periods, or or um, you know you've got lots of other delivery pressures. So again, just just something to watch out for. Uh, some of the um, the national government departments are notorious for putting things out to bid just before Christmas, for example, um, or, or right in the middle of the main summer holiday period in August. So um, just just something to to think about. Um, and um, as Andrea said, sometimes the time scales to turn those bids around are very, very short. So need some careful, careful thinking. Um, we've already had mentioned this morning about uh, different types of bids and 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 how many stages they involve. So could be a nice, simple, straight submission, some sort of assessment process, uh, and then uh, a, a tick in the box or unfortunately a rejection. But in a lot of cases, we're now on two stage bids in life, so sometimes an expression of interest, which often isn't too detailed. And then if you get through that first hurdle, then a working up of a full stage bid. But equally, uh, there are occasions where it's a three stage process, which actually involves a presentation, which is the last competitive hurdle. Um, uh, so again, something to think about. Are you likely to have to pull the information that you've put together in your bid into some sort of presentation of what's that going to look like? So um, again, the presentations, um, they're not exclusive to larger bids. Um, in my experience, I've often had to do presentations for relatively small bids. Um, but they are a very important part of um, convincing whoever is making that um, decision that you, your organisation, your service is, is what they want to fund. So, again, something to be thinking about and preparing for. Um, scoring mechanisms, again, something that have become increasingly used these days. Um, and so it's very useful to reflect on what that scoring mechanism is. Um, usually it will be a weighting of how uh, how important your your experience is, how important your methodology is, um, and then usually um, how you've costed something. Um, Sometimes it might be a 30% is down to how you costed something. Sometimes it might be a 40% um, in, in my recent experience. So again, just, just reflecting on how your bid is going to be assessed. Um, and, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, We've already made reference to um, whether things are being submitted 
through bidding platforms or whether they're they're free form this morning and by that i mean you know uh, is is the the dreaded online form um which you're which you're typing into um which brings with it all sorts of particular um challenges and it's often much safer to write something um in advance in in word or whatever and make sure you're then comfortable with that before you're dropping it into the um the 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 online form but equally um there are plenty of opportunities these days where you're actually required to put together a, a document and and su simply submit a document via email so um I, I sadly I can remember the days where um, hard copy bids used to used to be the thing, uh, and um, you know a sea of envelopes would uh, would would arrive um, uh, to be worked through. But I, I I think it's very very rare today that um, anything is is hard copy. Um, I mean, if anybody's got any experience of things, actually. Um, still being hard copy I'd, I'd be interested to hear it but i think everybody these days is expecting um uh either something submitted through a bidding portal a bidding platform or or you know a a, a, a typed document whether that document's in word or whether it's um, uh, in a powerpoint format or whether you've pdf'd it or, or whether you've done something um something in in some sort of um uh, other software um, will will come on to sort of costing costing structures and and project plans in a minute. Um, important things about knowing your audience is um, like many things in life. Um, it's doing your homework. It's it's knowing um, the organisation that you're bidding to. Uh, what their policy drivers are or what the policy drivers are in the area that you're looking to bid um, around um, and are there any current issues that you can link your your um your bid to so that um, it looks like you are absolutely on top of what the the national agenda is or the local agenda if obviously if you're bidding into Bassett Law District Council for example then you would be reflecting um, any of Bassett Law District Council's stated priorities you'd be reflecting um, any of the local challenges you might have uh, done a bit of homework and got uh, latest uh, census data and you might be using that to support your arguments so um, there are often all sorts of uh, useful places to uh, to do your research uh, office for national statistics if you want absolute current uh, data you've got uh, often an insight function that the local authorities will be providing insight Nottinghamshire, insight Derbyshire, which will give you all sorts of useful census and public health data. Um, so I would urge you to to do that piece of homework to to strengthen bids in many many instances. Um, language is something else which um, is ever changing and. Um, uh it's um it's making sure that the language that you use is um current um and reflects that audience that you are submitting that funding bid into so um i would again urge people to think quite carefully about language when when they're writing bids to make sure that um if you've if you're actually responding to a specification, um, then you're playing some of the words back to the, whoever's written that specification and using that appropriate language. Um, word count, another <laughs> another challenge, uh, current day challenge, particularly, uh, but not exclusively, but particularly if you're having to submit into some sort of online portal, into some um, bidding platform process, there will often be a pretty tight word count. 
Um, so that requires some <laughs> uh, hard editing at times. And it is very, very challenging uh, because you've got lots to say about yourself, your organisation, your who you're looking to support, um, issues, all of that, all of that's got to get in there. You've got to demonstrate your experience, et cetera, et cetera, but you've got to get it into 200 words or some sort of oh dear, moment. So um, sometimes there are little ways to manage um, the word count challenge. Sometimes you can move um, uh, things into supporting documents and attach those uh, when you're bidding through bidding platforms. So, so do see whether that's that's possible. Um, but um, uh, it is it is uh, it is a challenge to to hit those word counts. So, just you know, do your do your editing in Word outside of your. Um, bidding platforms and just be ruthless, be ruthless and um, uh, if necessary, get, you know, a second pair of eyes to look over it, because often if if you've invested the time in writing something, you get too close to it and um, it's it's much easier for somebody to be that editor and, and to get that word count down for you. So additional information, this is sometimes where you can be uh, clever around word counts. Um, depending on what's required of you, you will be asked to demonstrate uh, relevant experience. Now that might be through um, attaching uh, CVs of the people who are going to be involved, or it might be by listing off relevant experience to the bid. Um, You'll also uh, absolutely going to have to cost something and we'll come on to costings uh, in a bit. Um, sometimes you're asked to provide um, supporting policies or statements. Um, equality and diversity and inclusion would be one or potentially um, uh, Data security might be another, sometimes sustainability. Um, so these are all things that need to be thought about and in place um, before submitting, but also back to this, know your audience. And obviously, if you're submitting um, into um, an organisation uh, that's all about, I don't know, sustainability, um, if you're putting a submission in, then then you know your your own sustainability statement needs to be absolutely current. So make sure that those supporting policies are current. I appreciate that's 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 a whole job in itself, but um, you know things like safeguarding need to be absolutely current if you're um, uh, if 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 you're uh, submitting a policy, a supporting policy that um, deals with either. Uh, children and young people or indeed adult safeguarding. So um, risk analysis, very often um, you'll be asked for a risk analysis. Usually I would say that's a high level risk analysis and it's probably identifying the top three, the top five risks to um, delivery uh, and what you would do about mitigating those risks. So um, we'll come on to a little bit more around those and, and perhaps a bit more of a discussion around um, potentially um, sharing, sharing sharing some ideas around some of those. But has anybody got any comments or questions on this whole issue of, of knowing your audience? I think we've got a question from Andrea. Heather. Yep. Sorry, it was just a comment for colleagues that are newer to this. Um, I'm just mindful that um, there's lots of jargon involved in this. So if if some of this is going over your head, please keep notes. We're going to create 
create and collate lots of resources to support you, including a glossary. So when we're talking about commissioning and procurement and frameworks and all of that stuff, you might not know what we're talking about. So please, please just scribble it down and we and the wider team will help you with that if, if you really need to it. That was all I was going to say, Heather. There was so much in what you just said. I'm mindful that um, there's <laughs> masses of top tips in there. So don't worry, it is yeah. being recorded. We will yeah. collate and summarise them. Um, okay. And thank you. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Any any other comments from anyone? Otherwise, I'll um uh, I'll I'll just move move on if that's all right. Okay, David, are you all right? Just to move the move the slide on. Yeah, I was just going to just dive in very quickly. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just in terms of top tips, I think one for me here would be about doing your research. Um, I mean, it's. Sometimes you know you'll get a, an opportunity, uh, you won't have a lot of time, and the temptation is you just sort of dive in there and start writing it because you just want to get the pain out of the way and go on and do something more exciting instead. Um, and this is something I've had to learn over the years that you just need to press pause and you need to do your kind of due diligence behind uh, who's funding it, where's the money coming coming from, uh, check them out. Have they got a, have they got a strategy, a strategic plan? Um, which may be another pain in itself reading through it, but do it, look at it and work out who they are. You may know them very well and not need to do that bit, but if, if you can re refresh who they are, um, look at their, their their aims and objectives, the, the desired outcomes. We'll talk about outcomes and outputs in a short while. That's very important to, to, to sort of get your head around. Um, but really just look at who's funding it, what are they about, what are they trying to achieve, how does that relate to their strategy, and that will then help you build up that solution, that design methodology that Heather and I are going to talk you through in a, in a short while. Um, word count is interesting because, you know, you're going to sometimes have a complete open field, no word limit, do what you want, get it down. Temptation is that you just want to write thousands and thousands of words. Sometimes there is a word count, a thousand words for this response about how you're going to deliver and you're going to want to put 999 or a thousand words. My experience again is just be concise. If you, if you can express it and get it done uh, in a limit of around 1,000 words, you can do it in 600 words and you're happy with it. That's probably going to go down better with the, uh, the funding organisation than you just pushing it to the barrier every time. You're going to feel like you want to fill that space. It's not always the case. And again, when it's that free format, don't write thousands and thousands of words to a, a response because the, you know, the, uh, the appetite to, to put up with uh, heavy worded and, and, and heavy responses when a, a funder has got lots and lots of applications on the table, you know, energy starts to, to, to drain rapidly. So keep things concise, snappy, punchy, and really express what you're going to do and deliver in as concise a way as you can. Sorry, let's move on. Thank you, David. Um, just a little bit here about bidding structures. Um, I think all of you this morning when you've talked about um, recent work that you've done, you've talked about sort of bidding as 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 an individual organisation. Um, and um, nine times out of 10, that is the case. But also also we've got some people in the room um, who are part of larger organisations. Um, and um, with with actual uh, bid writing teams, but also we've got sometimes the opportunity to be part of a bigger bid. Um, and um, so I just wanted to do a little bit of reflection on this. Um, I mean, on any bid, uh, you need to look at the scale and the time frame of what you're actually bidding for. And I know that a number of you are very keen to try and cover elements of your core costs through bidding. Um, uh, in terms of what what things you need to be thinking about, you've got to be thinking about, um, you know, if it's if it's a one of you mentioned a three five year project. Whoever's looking at that particular project, um, I think it was lottery that um, was lottery cash that was mentioned. They will need assurance around what your oversight and your governance processes are. Um, and on a practical point, you as an organisation will need to be thinking about cash flow and what that looks like over 
time frames um, uh, and, 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 you know, address your own sort of bidding um, priorities accordingly, really. Um, in terms of bidding, as I've said, many of you are bidding in, in, in an independent way, but there are opportunities to bid for larger pots of funding in sort of partnership or consortium arrangements. Partnership is usually a sort of hub and spoke, a lead and a delivery partner model. Um, and both David and I have seen this used um, extensively across the voluntary sector in the in the East Midlands, um, where um, you will have a lead large, usually a lead larger voluntary sector organisation and then a range of delivery partners, other voluntary sector organisations. Um, and particularly for bigger projects, it, it works well. But like anything else, you need to work out beforehand how that's going to work regarding any aspects of project management, the whole issue of funding profiles and claiming funding down, how you're going to performance report, how you're going to deal with them, any uh, audit issues. Sometimes funders will send out auditors during the course of longer projects to take a look at anything and um, whether potentially that could uh, identify any clawback issues, funding clawback issues. So, um, but partnership bids certainly have seen them work well um, and um, a number of organisations really flourish through being part of larger larger bids um just that issue of scale um and 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 collective sharing of expertise um has really made a difference consortium arrangements um as sort of equal partners is another bit sort of bidding structure that can be used uh, again the same things need thinking about how is it going to be managed um as as a consortium, um, there are instances um, sometimes around bigger sort of skills funding type um, opportunities where particular um, uh, organisational structures, special purpose vehicles have been drawn up, but those are usually for much bigger uh, longer term projects. So um, just something to think about really. Um, we're not exclusively here talking about bidding as as individual organisations in our own right. We're also talking about thinking strategically about partnership bids and, and what scope there is to to work collectively. Um, so any comments, questions around around that? I think we're all right on that, David. Do you want to just pop on to the next slide? A question from Andrea. Sorry, Sorry. not, not yeah. a question. Comment. Apologies. I'll, yeah, I'll keep throwing in info no, no, if absolutely. that's OK um, in terms of wider support we offer. So separately to this, but complementary, whatever the word is, <laughs> it complements this, is, is support around consortia development. We're doing a whole piece of work around that. So for those interested, uh, please get in touch and we've got um, a support package attached to that. Um, the other thing I wanted to say was back to your cash flow point, um, Heather, because that sometimes means even if you're successful, you become a bit unstuck. And I, I certainly know of an organisation that waited over 12 months for payment after delivery started. So if you don't have that cash flow as an organisation, that either means you don't bid in the first place or it creates problems down the line when you realise what's going on. So the, the other thing I just wanted to flag, and it would involve another bid, ironically, is that the key fund provides loans to, and, and one of the functions of those loans is to cash flow and enable you to um, bid for that kind of big pot of money that you might otherwise not be able to manage because you've got to pay staff and so on. They can't wait for 12 months. They also have a uh, have a grant element that will usually cover the interest part of the um, loan facility they offer. So it was just another tip, really. Yeah, no, brilliant. Um, Thank you. 
Yeah, 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 no, definitely. I mean, I, I can also think of some organisations that have come unstuck in terms of cash flow on often on big skills or um, uh, back to work um, type projects um, particularly. So, OK, David, could you just pop it over to um, to the next slide? So um, assessment processes. So um, again, this we're all in this sort of preparing, preparing. You've done your research, you've thought about your structures. Just give a bit of thought to the assessment process. Um, we've talked about are you responding to a formal invitation to tender ITT uh, jargon sorry on the slide there but invitation to tender um, as opposed to a sort of looser can you submit us a proposal request um, so have a think on that um, just an aside but um, sometimes if you are responding to a particular specification in my experience, wash my mouth out, but um, it won't actually be that well written. Um, some of them are really poorly structured and you can actually and you do need to spend quite a lot of time working out what exactly is is required and, and, and what the key drivers are. So so um, if you're somebody like me that, that gets some um, irritated by these things then you know just it, it, it's one of life's things that often whoever's putting together these specifications in many instances um uh, yeah, procurement isn't isn't their background they've been asked to get some uh, support in address a particular issue in their community so sometimes the specifications aren't that well written so um, we've already talked about you know this this whole issue of how many bidding stages are are there is it an expression of interest and in a full bid or is it a one stage process straight to a full bid um, and you know in which case obviously think about time frames around all of that and you know just what else you've got going on in your organization what else you've got going on in your life is it in the middle of the school holidays whatever else is 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 going on so um if it is a formal tendering process then um often there is the opportunity to ask questions uh there will be a clarification um time frame usually um well it, it depends on how tight the overall time frame is but usually there is time to go back and ask questions of whoever's putting out that particular um tender requirement so if you've got questions i would say ask them you know it is the opportunity to get that clarification depending on the process if everything's being done completely uh, in a transparent online via a portal way, then um, all of that information, everybody's questions will be collated and then all responses will be shared and in the public domain, which will inform any anybody and everybody who is um, intending to bid. If you've been invited, if you're on a, you know, a much tighter uh, the local authority has asked you to submit or um, uh, you know, you know, there are some particular challenge funds that you're submitting for, then if you've got queries in advance, I would say for heaven's sake, you know, try and raise them. People can only say no, I can't share that information at this stage. Um, I mean, sometimes it's not clear what funding is available. If it's not clear, it's often worth an ask. Uh, they can only they can only say, oh, we can't really divulge that at this stage. So I would say simply ask. Um, we've already talked about this whole issue of word count and 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 being succinct and and how to manage manage um, manage word count. And we've already talked about um, um, scoring mechanisms and weightings. Um, look very carefully at how important 
your costing, your prices. If there's a scoring mechanism in that says, you know, 40% is on price, um, then, you know, you, you need to think quite carefully how you're structuring your bid um, and knowingly, you know, costing in the elements that you're including in that bid. So uh, just, just go into it with your eyes open, I would say, uh, depending on how um, price is weighted in any sort of specification. Uh, and again, back to this issue of if it is a three or is it if it is a process that includes a presentation. And as I say, sometimes you might submit something and then be required to to present. Uh, be prepared for it. Um, have that presentation to hand, give some time um, to thinking through what sort of questions you might have to respond to. Um, in many instances now, uh, the whole process, if it's a presentation, will be conducted online, but it might be face to face, in which case, you know, that that needs preparation um, as well. So just a little bit of thought around the assessment process and how you're going to respond it, to it. Very, very occasionally, um, if you're submitting, um, I mean, the lottery uh, certainly do this, um, they will come back to you with clarification questions. If there are aspects of your bid that, that they, you know, think uh, haven't quite got it or, you know, not quite sure what you mean by this, they will come back to you and ask those questions. So obviously respond promptly um, and like, like any exam, answer the question. So um, those would be my comments around assessment process. Um, anybody got any particular comments or questions around that? I'm conscious of time and waffling on quite a bit probably. Andrea, I think you're on mute, Andrea. There we go. Um, yeah, I just wanted to underline the point you made, um, Heather, of have, having been on both sides of it. Um, not only answer the question, which sounds like stating the obvious, but funders tell us, some, some funders tell us 50% of applicants don't get the funding because they haven't answered the question. Um, read the scoring criteria, as Heather said, and the specification and the score and align all four. And often, actually, so I'm just sharing my pain here, what scores highest won't be an answer to just one of those things. You've got to address all four. And on top of that, <laughs> I would always recommend it's worth the time if they're offering a, a what they call a pin, a product, product, product information, something. It's an event, basically an information event um, from a particular funder. Go to it. If it's online, it's a webinar. Go to it because you're going to hear things in that that they haven't written down anywhere. And it'll often give you that real insight about what they're really after. So it's always worth that hour or two um, in terms of uh, getting more uh sharper and higher scoring answers so yeah i just wanted to share the pain really they make it like a, a it's almost like a, a challenge isn't it like hunger games or something you've got to work out what do you really want from these four or five different sources of information but it's it's really worth cross-checking all of it which yeah. you've already said heather but i just wanted to work no that. no 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 absolutely absolutely okay what, what tends to work for me uh and the work that we we often do when we're when we're bidding uh, Heather and I are bidding for opportunities when it's answering the question um, rather than just kind of type out that your complete answer that could be to one or a number of questions in the specification builds your response against each question so you know you've got your list of questions or your key question try and break that down and then slot your responses uh, against each 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 aspect each bullet point or, or series of questions so you, you can see the match between what you're saying as a response and what they're asking for in terms of their their key questions uh, and then you, that allows you to sort of like criticize it look at it scrutinize it think have i got this right am i answering each stage of this question each element it's really important to, to sort of think about that sort of discipline of making sure what you're putting down ultimately is answering the question um, another one is around the basics you know, what's required in terms of the response overall 
Uh, is it two sides of A4? Is it 26 sides of A4? Where are the limitations? What are the rules? What are the format uh, requirements? Come up with a checklist right at the start of what you need to do for the submission. I mean, I've been brutal in the past when I've been uh, commissioning uh, and funding, and I've asked for four sides of summary uh, A4 as a response, and I've had 20, and I've just shredded. Uh, you know, the, the, the 16 or so sides that uh, go beyond that limit, you, you stick to the rules. And you, need to, you need to get that a bit clear as part of that um, planning and preparation. Um, presentation as well. Um, I mean, most of us, um, well, occasionally you get somebody that loves presenting and public speaking, but it can be quite daunting. Um, a lot of people hate uh, doing presentation. Uh, and I think like um, Heather said, just prep. Have a go yourself before you do the real thing. Look yourself in the mirror, stand in front of friends or family, whatever can help you just sort of rehearse it a little bit uh, and learn the lines before you do the real thing. That, that's just something that I've learned to do over the years. I was terrified of public speaking and presenting uh, the, when I first started doing this 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 work, uh, and it's just something I've used, uh, you know, tactically addressed through learning and rehearsing and preparing and uh, and then giving it giving it a go. Um, you know, it's just part of that kind of role of approaching this. Sorry, Heather, um, moving on. No, that's fine. Um, I'm just going to say we we promised people uh, a little comfort break. Uh, would people like to take that now or would they like us to um, plough on, so to speak? Um, I think um, I think now's a, a, a logical point to in terms of how how we're going to move on if if people would like five ten minutes yep should we say come back at um seven minutes past ten minutes okay for everybody <laughs> seven that minutes sounds... past yeah. that's very precise david brilliant that's lovely great see everybody in the seven minutes past thank you <laughs>
I'll be doing. Kim, should we make a start, David? Yeah. You want to pick this one up, David, or shall I? Yeah, I can do this. Yeah, all right, great. Right, OK. Hopefully uh, everybody's back. Let's crack on. Um, so the methodology is often at the really the heart of the, the core of the, you know, the aspects of the response. I appreciate there's a lot of variety again, like we said, so sometimes depending on the, the scale, the level of funding that you're going for, it may just be a you know one or two side more, more sort of generalized uh, response you need to to uh, to put in particularly if it's for smaller grants uh, i appreciate that but usually certainly in our experience there needs to be some form of dedicated methodology uh, that you've got to um, describe in the response so the method how you're going to do it you know what's going to be the solution basically uh, to the uh, to ultimate to the requirement, um, and this is really going back. That you know, the first point is going back to the specification. Uh, what's being asked for uh, from the funding? Um, which organisation uh, is, is is funding it? Um, my point earlier about doing your your research and what Heather was saying about doing the research. Uh, into that funding organisation is really important at this stage uh, to ensure that you you start that methodology the right way, uh, that you're very clear about what you're uh, aiming to achieve uh, through your response overall, um, what's going to be delivered uh, in terms of outputs, and what's going to change, what's going to be going to be the impact uh, in terms of outcomes. Now, it, outputs and income, uh, out, outputs and outcomes, not incomes, outputs and outcomes are often confused and modelled up uh, and um, you know I see this quite often I've seen it in the past through uh, the, the the times I've scrutinised uh, uh, bids uh, when I've asked for clarity around uh, what's going to be delivered uh, in terms of results but then actually what's what does it mean what's going to be affected what's going to change from that delivery uh, so getting that, that that difference is right is really important you know if I'm a uh, if I'm a if I'm a cake maker and I'm bidding to uh, uh, to uh, uh, improve my cake making facilities, uh, I'm obviously making this up right now, but if I'm bidding to improve my cake making facilities and I've got to describe what I, what the result's going to be and what the, uh, the, the, the outcome's going to be, well, I'm going to talk about uh, baking far many cakes, far more cakes. Uh, I'm going to put a number on that in terms of my outputs. But I'm going to describe the uh, the impact that all those extra cakes are going to make in my local community, which is clearly going to be a you know well-being and a much much happier community that I'm uh, I'm serving. Uh, there's obviously flip sides to those outcomes, which I won't go into. But in terms of eating too many cakes, but uh, in terms of positive outcomes, then that's what I'm going to describe. Um, so just getting that that clarity 
right around um, your your aim, your your, your results uh, from the the delivery of the, of the, uh, the work you intend to do through from the funding, and then the the ongoing impact is really important. Now, increasingly, what we see being asked for uh, is a logic model. Any of you any of you come across this logic models theories of change? Anybody want to have a go at what they are? I no. think it's a stunned silence. silence. They've all been spared. They've all been spared the logic models yeah, thus far, yeah. David. Yeah. Oh, Andrea. We've got, we've got hand hand, really. <laughs> no, no, sadly, I haven't been spared and I'm not even going to try and attempt to explain what it is. And, and it's very common in HE where I work for a time. Uh, but I think it will be useful if we send you a copy of one so you can see what it looks like. Um, and, and my background, it was kind of a plan on a page that has all of that. You know, it's got it trying to achieve the outcomes, the outputs, uh, and it breaks it right down, but it's very, very brief and on a page. It's my very rubbish explanation of my experience of it. Uh, that's brilliant. Um, they, 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 you can get bogged down by them, uh, and I've seen seen some awful ones, um, kind of put out strategically by organisations, but also in terms of project responses too. Um, they are basically a plan, uh, ideally, if you can do it in one page of what you're intending to, to, to achieve, what your aims are, uh, how you're going to go about it. So what the activities are going to be or the interventions, uh, what the results going to be, which are those outputs. So I'm going to bake a load of cakes uh, and then ultimately what's going to be the uh, the outcome, what's going to change from the, uh, the proposal you're submitting. So it's that logic linear uh, uh, relationship between what you're planning to set out to do, what you're going to do, what's going to happen at the end of it, and what the longer term outcome is going to be. Uh, if there's anything that Andrea, the BCBS can send out, that'll be great uh, as a as a sort of reference point for logic models. That 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 will be that will be brilliant. Um, I wouldn't concern yourself too much about you know becoming an absolute expert in theory of change because it can really, unless you want to, it, it can be a complete distraction. But uh, a lot of organisations commissioning now point out their their theory of change as part of that background reference material you need to understand when you frame your methodology and your response overall. So that's I think it is a tip uh, from us that you know you need to uh, if you can start to invest a bit of time thinking that bit through. Um, can I sorry? Can I jump back in, David? Because I would yeah. say that even if it's not required by the funder, it's a painful but incredibly useful exercise to try and do it. Because if you can't summarise what you're trying to do on a page, you don't fully understand your model, yeah. and it highlights that for you. Uh, it's like everything being well for me anyway. As people who know me know well, being brief and succinct is very challenging. Yeah. So if you can do that and really, really understand what you're trying to achieve, you'll be able to explain it far better in, in the prose and the text of a, a bid. Yeah, I mean, some of you have mentioned uh, funding from the National Lottery. Uh, and I know, you know, from what they put out, uh, their various programmes and funding strands, they'll have logic models on the go. Uh, I know Sport England, which uh, I've seen from some of the feedback on the state of the sector that you know you're involved in as a, as a as a as a sector in terms of delivery. They're a big fan of logic models. Uh, Heritage Lottery Fund to uh, we'll ask for them or we'll, we'll, we'll kind of frame them in in their, their funding streams. Uh, so yeah, they really are getting more and more frequent. Um, and like Andrew said, if you can just become accustomed to what they are and how to use them to, uh, you know, build your response, that's a good thing uh, overall, uh, really. Um, recognising if in a competitive tendering process and demonstrating the USP's experience. Yeah, you know, uh, some of you um, may be fortunate enough to be exclusively invited to bid for a service. It much maybe a much more narrower, less competitive uh exercise where you know that you just really need to uh put across the key points and you stand a pretty good chance of uh, of winning the grant or the, the the project however you know as we experience in the in the pressures that we have uh, around budgets uh, that, that 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 involves increased competition um particularly on that sort of national scale of uh, of bidding and, and fundraising and, and bid writing uh, so increasingly it's important to think about what's unique in your offer. Um, 
again, there's, there's, this is a bit of an art here. It's, it's not an exact science. Uh, it's, it's about really revising and reviewing your intent, uh, thinking about what the aims and the, uh, the objectives are uh, from the specification and, and, and really putting something across that you feel is, is, is a fresh offer. I think thinking about the outcomes expected uh, by the, uh, the funding organisation about the, uh, the commissioner uh, is a good way to approach the USP. Exactly what are they after uh, ultimately? What's going to change ultimately from the funding that they're going to put out and that you're going to, going to go for? Uh, that's where you really need to be thinking about what's, what's going to be different. You know, what are you going to introduce? What are you going to create? What are you going to impact and affect ultimately that's going to have, uh, uh, going to make that key difference? Uh, and getting that through as a USP has been succinct uh, is, is really important. That will make it stand out um, in that increased competition uh, in a climate that we that we face. Um, costing, budget, efficiency, the economy uh, of, of the offer uh, is important. Now, some of this is wrapped up in uh, the type of delivery model you're involved in. Uh, you could be a sole venture, you could be a single organisation bidding, uh, you could be part of a, a wider consortium. Uh, what you've got to think about is um, how you will deal with things like management costs and management overheads, uh, because there's, a, there's an awful lot of scrutiny about the, uh, uh, the effective application of, uh, of management costs within a, within a project. So that really does get picked out. I've done it. I've really, really gone in there and looked very harshly at high management costs and high management overheads. Um, what the, the, the commissioner, uh, what the funder will look for is uh, unit costing. Uh, so what I mean by that is uh, when you look at your outputs, how many cakes uh, am I going to be uh, baking and delivering and how much am I asking for for my new oven baking facilities? Then they're going to really look at the ratio between cakes and, and the funding investment. So what's that package going to break down to in terms of their return on investment? Now, there's another angle we can go down here in terms of the value of outcomes as, uh, as well, which is something uh, perhaps we would come back to in another session where we start to think about social uh, value of, of outcomes, but you can describe within your uh, your methodology and your your costing plan what difference you think the funding is going to make on a uh, on a on a longer term outcome basis. This is important if you can do that uh, to to get that um, part of the, uh, the costing plan uh, in there. Um, you obviously need to be within the budget uh, envelope that's uh, being specified. You go over that most of the time, you're out straight away. Uh, if you're putting in there more than what they're prepared to fund, uh, that's that's a uh, that's a that's a red uh, red flag. Um, you may have to demonstrate um, some form of matched or in kind or a combination of two uh, contribution. Um, obviously, often a key requirement from you know our uh, previous European uh, programs when there needs to, needed to be a matched element. But I have seen it in domestic, what I call domestic is like UK and, and regional based funding, uh, where there needs to be a demonstration of how either through your organisation and the infrastructure you have or from the consortium, the partnership you're part of, how extra investment is going to be brought in alongside the money that you're uh, being asked, uh, that, you're, that you're, you're requesting as part of the, uh, uh, the fund that you're, you're bidding for. Um, it's always a good thing to think about added value and and how you can uh, demonstrate that through the, the costing plan. Uh, you know, I'll do it through uh, work that Blink Bright, my organisation, bids for. Uh, it could be um, pro bono contribution uh, from a, a strategic perspective. You know, I could be uh, evaluating, uh, wanting to evaluate a, a project nationally and bidding for a certain amount of money, but some of my time and some of my organisation's time uh, and contribution will be provided pro bono free, basically. Uh, and to do that, I'll think about where that can make most difference. And I often do that at the end when it comes to uh, thinking about the legacy and the sustainability of the work that we've done. Uh, a really important area to explore in terms of your offer and think about, well, actually, how can I support this beyond the time frame uh, of, the, uh, of the funding uh, itself? What can I do? What can my organisation do to check back in? To support the service, to support the uh, participants, the beneficiaries, 
if they're involved uh, in the uh, in the delivery on an ongoing basis. And that could be an area that you can explore in terms of the, the value uh, and the costing uh, overall. Um, we'll come into some of the, the issues around revenue and capital, but um, capital costs, but clearly you need to separate out the money that's going to go to uh, towards staff um, contribution, uh, existing or new posts being created uh, towards the, the delivery of services. All of these fall within that revenue uh, uh, context and then elements which may actually go towards uh, building improvement, new building acquisition, um, environmental improvement and so on, which is where the, you know, the capital or fixed assets, which is, you know, obviously your your equipment and infrastructure used to deliver the service itself, which is where the capital costs will come in. And there will often be a ratio and an expectation, very clear ground rules around how that's separated out in the uh, in the costing requirements. Um, timeline and this next point around project management, project plans rather, uh, is is key. Um, I've I've used so maybe you may have come across Gantt charts before, which is when you you sort of visualise your project timeline uh, in a in a series of uh, of, 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 of charted uh diagrams showing you service delivery over over periods of time uh, and, and 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 showing the links between different elements of what you're going to do uh that looks great but actually it works just as well within a within a table or a very well described uh piece of text uh, where you're breaking down uh packages of work or strands of work uh, against time frames uh, obviously, you need to look at the specification uh, and think about the overall requirement. You know, the, the delivery window that's been specified. Is it is it a month? Is it six months? Is it over several years? And build your timeline uh, around that. Um, something that Heather and I do uh, very often is uh, build up the uh, the methodology and uh, arrange the timeline in a series of work packages. We'll call them work packages, uh, and we'll describe that work package. Uh, we'll build them together sequentially in terms of the overall project time frame and we'll explain what they are, how much time is involved in each work package, who's going to be responsible for delivering it, what elements are going to be delivered, what the outcome is going to be of each stage, what the outputs are going to be of each stage uh, and over what time frame they're going to be delivered. So they're like, they're like your building blocks basically of your overall uh, service response. Um, bit chicken and egg about whether you, whether you start with a uh, a time plan, a project plan, and then build the methodology, or whether you uh, you look at your solution and and, and come up with the, the answer to the, the questions that I described, and then from that you build uh, your your project time frame. Um, I've done both. I probably tend to start with a project plan first and foremost. I'll look at the uh, the requirement. I'll look at the questions. I'll think about the, uh, the, uh, the elements I want to deliver that respond to those questions, and then I'll build a, uh, a, a project plan uh, built, broken down into work packages uh, with, like I said, fully costed elements for each package and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a clarity about what each package involves. And then I'll go back to the, the requirement to actually express all of that in a, in a, in a piece of uh, context or a piece of text over a word counted requirement uh, answer. Um, so I tend to these days go start with my project plan uh, and then build it from build it from there. Um, but the tips really are uh, being clear about the time frame, uh, being realistic about what you can deliver. Uh, obviously, articulating each stage as clearly as possible, uh, and and thinking about how uh, your services will work together if you are describing more than one service throughout the whole bid response. You know what is that that kind of that, that journey of delivery you're going to be going down that all links together and works logically that the commissioner the funder can see when they start to look at your response your methodology and uh, and your project plan in particular so a lot there to i realize i rattled through that pretty quickly a lot there to consider um i know some of you are going to have experience of this because you know some of you uh a bid and done well um any any thoughts any comments any questions any further top tips? <laughs> that was a comment, I think, from Teresa there, David. So feeling a little overwhelmed. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, I mean, Andrea, did you want to pick up on the um, support from Lucy and Marzina um, that's available at this point? Or um, I, I think we'll follow up afterwards. Um, OK, Marjana and Lucy can certainly okay. um, yeah. help find the right support for you, even if they don't have it. And, and as Marjana said, she's she's new to it as well. But yeah. there's a big team here, not just the three of us yeah. who can uh, kind of handhold you through some of this. Um, I would say that my only other top tip, probably sadly I'm so old I've got loads, <laughs> but is have a go because you learn, don't wait for a bid that you're interested in, have a go at writing some of this stuff about your organisation because a lot of it will be the same no matter what your proposal and the project is. Everyone will be tailored to their specification in your service but all of the things Heather's talked about, you know, risk and price and quality and all of those keywords they they require different kind of answers um and you should have answers to those questions now actually whether or not you've got a proposal for a particular additional project in mind so it's really useful to start kind of straight away and and maybe Teresa if you're feeling overwhelmed just pick one area to start with you know and, and just have a go at that and then that will highlight what you don't know what the gaps are and it's it's a kind of ongoing journey that's my only latest tip <laughs> Yeah, we're so doing that ourselves as well just to share no matter how much you do it you need to keep doing it so we're yeah. doing it ourselves as bcvs for bcvs yeah yeah it's absolutely fine uh teresa to to have those concerns and feelings and to be honest i've been doing this for i shouldn't really admit how long over 25 years now and i still feel overwhelmed at times when i see something that um i know i should be going for but i don't quite know I'm going to get my head around to putting in a response. It can feel quite overwhelming uh, when uh, policies change so quickly and priorities change so quickly and you've got to be adapted to that change. Um, I suppose my way to, through that is just start at the beginning and think about what's being asked for and what you can do uh, as, as a service response before you start thinking about logic models and thinking about project plans and Gantt charts and risks and everything else. Just write it out. Think about the questions uh, in the in the in the in the specification, uh, and then how you would approach that. Type it out, and that's the first stage, really. You know, you've got some ideas forming from that. You can review it, and then these other building blocks can then start to uh, take shape. So it's just trying to break it down and start at the beginning is probably the, the the way I would approach it. I hope that helps. Okay. Any other comments, thoughts? Um, just concerns. a quick comment from me, um, and again, it would only um, potentially um, apply to to some of the organisations on the call. But just have a bit of a mind um, for a VAT uh, when you're putting together any um, any funding submission. If your organisation is is vatable, then obviously you need to be thinking about the VAT implications. Um, often, if if you're responding to a particular specification, they will ask you to quote inclusive of VAT, but very very occasionally it's exclusive of VAT. So so just just keep an eye on the VAT. That's all I would say on that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Should we move on? Yeah. Do you want me to pick this up, yeah. David? Or please, yeah. Yeah. So on on costing, um, I mean, at the risk of us sounding like a broken record, but respond to the specification if there is one. Um, you know, if you've been given a funding, you know, the funding that's available to bid for is X, then obviously tailor your um, tailor your costings accordingly. Um, uh, and the absolute no no is to go over and over and above that. Um, in terms of management costs and overhead recovery, we've already mentioned that in some instances there may be a fixed overhead recovery rate um, to 
a particular funding stream. I mean, the lottery, I think, particularly have partic have have specific rates that they would want um, not to see exceeded. Um, uh, but as David's already uh, indicated, funders are pretty well attuned to um, large amounts of uh, overhead recovery. Um, being um, put into funding bids. So you do need to be quite realistic on that one. And I appreciate, you know, the challenge of getting those those core costs covered. I absolutely appreciate it. Um, some funding bids um, may require day rates. It depends again on the on the on the funding source. Uh, who you're bidding into, they might actually um, want differentiated um, day rates. So again, that's something to be giving a bit of thought about. Um, and they need to be differentiated to who you're actually talking about delivering in the proposal. If you're looking to recruit to deliver a particular service, uh, if you're looking to use um volunteers to deliver um all of that needs to be reflected um in your response so just just give a bit of thought to uh to day rates really um do remember to build in elements um like recruitment uh and the costs involved in recruiting if you are recruiting in either specific um, staff to deliver a service or indeed if you're looking to recruit uh, a batch of volunteers. And again, I appreciate how challenging it is at the moment to get volunteers and to retain volunteers. But if you're looking to build a new uh, cadre of volunteers um, around a specific agenda, then just think about the time and the costs involved in recruited. Are you going to be doing DBSs on them, costs, et cetera, et cetera? So um, training, training for both staff and training for volunteers. Think about building those into your costings. Um, so um, if you're bidding into, uh, for example, um, uh, national funding, um, uh, organizations they will absolutely expect to see those costs in there so please build them in um capital costs um david's mentioned capital um building costs building refurbishment um uh, any sp specific items of equipment again check what the funding source allows and if it's allowable also have a have a an eye to um, depreciation and and how you address depreciation in any funding bid. It may it may ask you to cover it. It may not, but you need to be thinking about it. Whatever in terms of that capital and uh, as I as I mentioned previously, just just keep an eye out for you know whether whether the bid is inclusive or exclusive of VAT um, if you are VAT registered. So. Um, Andrea, you'd got a question. Just a shout out for another specialist infrastructure organisation. So for those of you that aren't accountants, and I'm one of them, or from organisations where you don't have financial specialists in house, Community Accounts Plus is a finance infrastructure organisation that will support organisations across Nottinghamshire and beyond and their charity themselves. So if all of this is sounding like another language, um, seek support from them because capital and depreciation and all of that um, it is very technical and you you particularly for the lottery you're held to a much higher standard around capital bidding you really you've got to get all of that absolutely bang on and have specialist advice there so contact community accounts plus if, if you need that kind of advice yeah no absolute absolutely endorse the uh, the team they're really really helpful team and very used to working with a whole range of voluntary sector organizations from you know very small organisations to uh, to some larger ones. So yeah, a really helpful bunch of people. Any other comments, questions around costing?
Okay. Should we just move on to the next slide, David? So, um, supporting information. Um, I think at the outset we talked about some supporting information may be required for bids, um, and that um, could be quite a long list, could be quite a short list. Uh, some of the information you may have already um, uh, as a core part of, of your organisation and some you may have to pull together um, for a specific bid. So um, a little bit of a, a list here. Um, on the practical side of things, how is the information required? Is it, is it actually within the bid? or is it to be supplied as a separate document? Um, in, in, some, in a number of instances, it's a separate document so that um, whoever's assessing funding bids can, um, uh, can actually run through things uh, more quickly themselves. So um, in some instances, you might not actually have to provide it until uh, you get um, into some sort of contractual process. Oh. Teresa's just saying the slide's not changed on her screen. Is that, are people looking at supporting information generally? Yeah. Yeah. Perhaps just click yeah. um, refresh, Teresa, if, um, and, and see. Oh, right, great. Okay. Little little bit of a time lag there. So, so yes. Yeah. So, um, if, if you're lucky enough to be successful, you might not have to provide some of this information until after um, you've been informed that you're successful and you're moving forward into a contractual situation. So uh, that's typically the case with um, uh, local authorities, really. Um, so um, just a little run through what we've got there. Um, Skills and experience, staff skills and experience. So that might be required as a CV or, or a summary of your recent relevant um, projects and experience. And again, we're back to keep things as succinct as possible in, in whichever instance, really. Um, people are always interested in knowing um, if there are communications elements to a particular service delivery. Um, how are you going to actually let people know? Funders are always keen to have recognition themselves of funding support. So give, give a bit of thought yourselves to how you're actually going to promote a particular service um, and how you're going to communicate it. Um, yeah. Uh, online, uh, through um, printed medium, uh, talking about it in the local press, local radio, whatever. So a little bit of thought around marketing and comms. Um, we mentioned earlier a risk register. <coughs> Not always provided, but again, sometimes um, worth thinking this through relatively early on. It's the what if. You know, what, what, what if we can't recruit any volunteers? What are we going to do to mitigate? Um, you know, what if um, much funding doesn't come through? So thinking through your priority risks and how you're going to mitigate them. If it, re if it requires you to do a risk register as part of a bidding process, um, as I said earlier, I'd keep it to either a top three or a top five. Um, that will be perfectly adequate. And I'm making the assumption that for many of you, um, if you've got governance structures, you've got trustees, they will want to know these risks anyway. Um, volunteer manage recruitment and management. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Already um, talked about the fact that it's it's challenging to recruit volunteers at the moment. Um, but it may be that your bid actually requires you to put in some detail of how you're going to uh, carry out your volunteer recruitment and particularly your volunteer management. 
um, um, training, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, something to think about there. Um, if it's a partnership bid, um, it will need some sort of reference to those partnership um, management structures, governance, performance reporting, networking. That will need to be referenced in the bid. Um, equality, diversity and inclusion may require a statement in the bid, may require you to actually provide a supporting equality, diversity and inclusion policy. And again, I suspect that Andrew and the BCBS team may be able to uh, do some very useful signposting around that. Um, sustainability. What are you doing as an organisation? What is your commitment to um, addressing climate change, minimising um, the environmental impact, et cetera, et cetera? So a sustainability statement or indeed a sustainability policy um, might be required. General quality assurance, how you are going to um, manage um, your own quality assurance, are you, um, what sort of reviews have you got in place? What is your own governance? Um, and who's actually keeping an eye on, you know, the whole issue of delivery? So setting that out, it may be that you've got a, a generic quality assurance statement or you're adapting that and including it in um, your bid. It may be that you're identifying that a particular member of your team is responsible for the quality assurance on, on your particular service. And then you've got your statutory stuff such as insurances, approaches to health and safety, data security, um, and importantly, safeguarding both the children and young people and adults. And again, um, it may be that those are required as supporting policies or that you are referencing them in in your funding bid so um quite a lot there and certainly not all of it required at every time but in many instances a good number of the things on that list will actually be required as part of any sort of funding bid and should be part of your day-to-day -day, um thinking um and planning as an organization anyway um any comments or questions on that one andrea i think it'd be interesting if if this time but apologies if there isn't is a kind of show of hands who have the information on file now to be able to meet all of those criteria because they're fairly standard and that'll give you a kind of snapshot assessment of, of where to start yeah i mean we've probably got time actually to do that now i mean would people feel comfortable with doing that um if people look at that list um <laughs> if they think oh well we could manage most of that would Sorry. people be comfortable apologies i've just remembered it's being recorded so maybe drop it in the chat because yes. um yeah. That isn't recorded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we yes. won't we won't identify anybody in the discussion. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that would that would be really useful. Um, and then, as I say, it can also inform forward um, uh, forward support help from BCBS if um, if if people are identifying that there are particular areas that they would like help with. Um, uh, I, I certainly don't mind admitting, you know, there are a number of occasions where I, when I've been putting together particular bids, I've thought mm, I did have a sustainability statement, for example. I think it needs a refresh and I'll be phoning a friend, so to speak. Um, so um, I I think now is the opportunity for people to identify if there are elements on that list that it would be helpful to have some support with. So, um, yeah, yeah. OK. Um, David, do you just want to click us over to the next slide? 
yeah, yeah, I was just going to quickly add. Um, yeah. I mean, maybe Andrea, that you will cover some of this with your your projects uh planning management session at, at some point but i would have thought areas like quality assurance and risk managing risks um you know would fall within that kind of um, agenda really um i mean my tip around risks by the way if you've, you've not ever done this sort of risk identification and management you know a risk basically what's going to get in the way from you stopping uh stop, stop what's going to get in the way and stop you from delivering what you're setting out to deliver in your in your response just 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 describe that in a sentence or two uh and then you just really need to understand the scale of that risk so how important or how severe is that risk and one way of doing that is just thinking about what the impact of the risk will be what the likelihood of the risk will be and times in those two aspects together to come out with a an overall priority for that risk and one way that i do that is I give the impact a score from one to five, one to five, low impact to high impact, uh, and uh, the likelihood one to five times those two aspects together. So you've got a total out of 25 and you come up with a score. So if it's something that's really critical, will get in the way, will stop you from delivering and it's going to bring the whole thing down. Uh, if if that risk becomes apparent, then you give that a high score and a high prioritization. And then what you do is describe how you will reduce the chances or mitigate that risk. Um, so, you know, and just set that out really in a, a little table or in a, in a, in a sort of column uh, is, is usually the way I approach it. We approach it with the work that we, we do. Um, and you think about, you know, the, what you're planning to deliver, think about a series of risks uh, and score them accordingly, prioritise them and describe how you're going to go about stopping those risks from happening. Uh, get that bit right and you're going to get a, a good score on that part of the, uh, the response. All right. Um, yeah, and I think looking at people's comments that they've popped in the chat, and thank you for that, you know, people yeah. generally are saying um, that they've got quite a bit of that information, if not the majority of the information, and, and it's probably risk that would need uh, tailoring in or sharpening up. So um, that, that that simple risk register is, is, is a good, very good discipline to have when, when putting together a funding bid. So um, without, you know, um over over egging over egging the pie or whatever whatever the analogy is um we, we we've just put together here a very very short list of of our lessons that we've learned to date and i think many of these we've covered this morning um answer the question um i mean i can remember that from um, from from doing my o levels all those years ago but you know re remember that one answer the question keep it succinct and focused um uh and have an eye to what your potential competition is if you are uh, bidding in a competitive tendering situation and therefore identify what's unique about your organisation and the service that you are proposing to deliver and how you're going to deliver it and make sure that that is differentiated in in your funding bid. Um, so have an eye to the competition um, and Remember to build in enough time to review. We've talked about timeframes this morning and how they've got very tight. Um, remember, you need time to have a, a, a look through things carefully uh, as potentially the principal author of a funding bid, but particularly if you're involved with other organisations and it's a partnership bid or if your bid needs a senior management or a trustee to sign it off, then make sure that you've thought about that um, and, and you've built in. I mean, everybody these days uh, appreciates that things are done at pace, but you just need to have thought about those timeframes, really. Um, try not to leave it until the submission deadline. Um, is another uh, top tip. Um, IT glitches can and do happen. Um, so try and get a received confirmation that your bid has actually uh, arrived in the inbox um, where, where you're sending it. I mean, um, uh, I, I can remember, you know, those, those um, 
very environmentally uh, impactful days where hard copy bids were coming in um, and um, you know, there'd be a there'd be an accident on the M1, and whoever was driving the bid in missed the funding deadline, and you'd then have this big, you know, discussion on um, whether whether there was really an accident on the M1, and whether you would allow them the extra four hours that they seem to have taken. But uh, I mean, obviously that doesn't happen these days, but IT glitches can and do happen. So just yeah try and make sure that you've got confirmation that it's there. And if uh, you're unsuccessful, and we've all talked openly today about uh, the fact that you're not likely to be successful every time. Uh, if you aren't successful, just ask for feedback and ask for specific feedback, not, not some generic, you know, high standard of bids and unfortunately you were unsuccessful waffle. Ask for specific feedback because that's how you improve um, and inform future bids. So um, do, do make sure that you ask that of whoever's actually reviewing any bid. Um, and we've already had this morning a number of you talking about making bids into particular funding uh, streams, not being successful the first or indeed the second time, but being successful the third time around. So that would be another related tip that if you're not, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again, because in many instances you can take that feedback and strengthen that bid for um for the next time around and and indeed you do then actually get um get your bid over the line so those would be my top tips anything else you wanted to um add into that david um i mean a bit a bit about the feedback it's it's always tough when we get negative feedback and sometimes you know we, we sort of shy away from asking the question. It's not an easy thing uh, for us. So, and I've been there. I, I've, I've been through national uh, funding opportunities, got right through to the end, uh, the last two, and travelled halfway across the country for a day long presentation for a project that would have, you know, brought in three years worth of delivery and, uh, and, and not been successful, and then got. When I asked for the feedback, it was difficult feedback um, to receive. But it's really important, like Heather said, you know, it really does help um, you reflect on the areas you uh, fell short on uh, and, and help you think through how you can address that uh, moving forward. Sometimes it's just not going to work out for you. you know, we can all do our best uh, and construct the most amazing response and tick all the boxes. Uh, but it could just not quite work for you on that day, whether that's at the final stage or uh, sifted out the at the application a point. Uh, and you ask for feedback, and the feedback you get may be pretty pretty thin uh, and, and not particularly helpful, uh, which can be frustrating. Uh, but it's really important to ask uh, and um, not beat yourself up too much about it. Uh, learn from those lessons. Um, and then, you know, the more you do, like with most things in life, the better you get at it and uh, you start to work out ways in which you can build on previous successful bids. You know, you can look at a format that you feel has worked really well, whether it's a project plan outline you've done or a risk register or just the way you've described the methodology that you've, you know, you've, you've, you've obviously done well at, you've, you've been successful and you can, you can use that, you can, you know, redeploy that for a, for another opportunity. So you get more economical with the way that you, you work this. So it's difficult to start, uh, going back to Teresa, your point about feeling overwhelmed, it's a really difficult journey to get involved in, but the more you do it, uh, the, the, the better, the better you will get, uh, you know, that, that is a promise from me that you will get better at it. Um, and then I probably just going back to my point around answering the question, Heather, like you said, and keeping it succinct. I've, I've read so many badly, waffly, flowery, you know, hard to get through responses that you just lose the will to live with after half a page, which is a shame, actually, because you really want to get the best from what's being described because you know how much time people have put into uh, to the response. Um, but when you have a stack of these to go through on a, on a highly competitive program, 
uh, then you know you have to then start to uh, look at it like that and be quite ruthless. Like I said earlier, be quite brutal about the way in which you start to sift out the ones that aren't uh, aren't working for you. Uh, so you know, being clear, being relevant about what you're going to do in response to the questions and the requirements, uh, and and just being very clear about the the wording and how you're putting that across. Uh, is, 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 is it really important? I think that will that set you ahead. That will give you that momentum at that application stage. Um, yeah, I think that's probably it in, in my experience. Anybody want to share anything else? Any any top tips? Any further top tips or experiences? Or indeed, have any concerns, questions, thoughts? I think and Andrea, do you want to come in there? Put your hand up. I was just going to throw in another one, which is only my very personal opinion. But after likewise reading thousands of bids, um, I would always suggest not to use a professional bid writer because you can spot them a mile away. Um, you'll get the rare exception where they really, really understand it. They're in and of that community. They're passionate and usually involved in another way. But nine times out of ten, you can spot them a mile away and you don't fund them as a as a commissioner. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. Only other. Yeah. 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 Lucy. Just just a tip. I was telling Andrew about it actually one time, but when talking about IT glitches, it's happened twice when I've supported people putting people putting bids in and then they think that the IT hasn't worked. And so they've contacted the funder and the and the funder has said, Oh yes, you've got something wrong and, and the funders helped them to submit. And that's that's on two separate occasions. So don't don't think, oh no, you know, I don't think and just just give up. Um yeah. give them a ring and see if there's something yeah. at their end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, no, the IT glitch can be anywhere, can't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just something that occurred to me that we we haven't really covered and, and it is relevant is um references. Sometimes bids will ask you for um uh other organizations that you've worked with um as a referee as a reference and so something else to give some thought to in in advance ideally uh because again it's something else that you don't want to be scrabbling around for at the last minute so if they do ask you to provide references then just think who have you worked with which organizations have you worked with um who would provide you with a reference that supports the funding bid that you're submitting. So think about relevant references which are going to have some um, gravitas with whoever you're actually submitting the funding bid into. So just another one around that. Any other comments, top tips that people would want to share or indeed any, all oh, this went completely wrong and therefore I have learned um, uh, and won't be doing that again type of comments. Stunned silence. OK, well, um, I think we're nearly there. Um, I hope it's been useful. Uh, I mean, it's been really great meeting you all and learning about your organisations. Uh, and it's it's brilliant at BCBS for you to put on this this opportunity for, for local organisations too. Um, both Lucy and Marzina introduced their roles and I'm sure they're here to uh, pick up some of the feedback and think along with Andrea, think about uh, the way forward for further support. And I know Andrea has alluded to some of that uh, already today. Um, I mean, please do raise a hand now if there's anything else you would like to say, uh, including feedback for us. Talk about feedback. I I'm hoping that um, today has gone to plan, but if it hasn't, if there's anything you feel you would like to know more about or didn't quite understand or would like to have included in a similar session like this uh please do you know either now or, or via an email uh let us know uh, it's really important for our work to support the sector and support you and moving forward um hopefully 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 you found it useful
Yeah. I've seen a couple of thumbs up. That's great. I'll take that as a resounding yes. Now, can I ask a question? Yeah. Of, yeah. of the wider group, actually. Um, we, I mean, we will circulate um, some fee feedback forms and we have got lots of resources and follow up um, support available for you. Um, but just as a kind of round robin, wherever you're at now, and often a very simple rag rating, red, amber, green can help you understand the level you're at. What would be of most use for you and your organisation from BCVS? What support would you like from us? Lauren's, Lauren's just asking if a copy of the slides is available. Uh, that's that's absolutely fine, isn't it, Andrea? We can. Those can be circulated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. We, yeah. We're developing, for example, just to give you another example, um, a self-assessment tool to help you identify against all of the criteria that have been discussed today where you're at as an organisation and what support. Um, you might need. Would you find that of use? Shall we forward that on to you as well? Yes, please. That'd be great. Just yes, the yes. Yeah, yes, please, Andrea. Brilliant. OK. Um, the, the reason I asked you the earlier question was um, Obviously, we've got quite a broad range of support available, but if there was a, a consensus around a particular area, we can then bump that up and arrange a, a focused workshop or, or whatever would be of most use. So I was just trying to get a gauge as there a particular area, talk quite a lot about risk um, and there's other areas we've talked about as well. So maybe that's one for you to reflect on. Yeah, Andrea, sorry, the the bit around the logic models and theory of change I'd find really useful, please. OK. Yeah. Yeah, I'd agree with that, please, Andrea. It'd be brilliant, the logic model and theory of change. So we've got something to go to go with. Thank you. You're welcome. And, and, and yeah, I'd really recommend as a an infamous procrastinator, don't put it off. <laughs> you know, every half hour spare you've got, carve that out and have a bash at drafting because it's amazing how much you can write in half an hour if you really focus. Take a question, write it, and then um, you've got the start of it. So often with bids, some people are very methodical. Um, some people are procrastinators like me. Starting is the hardest point, so don't put it off. Start now, and then whatever comes out, whatever opportunities, you're in a stronger position. That's my kind of final top tip. I should write a book. We should all write a book. <laughs> I think um, I've just thought actually, and and this is one for Lauren and Joe to ignore. My final top tip is chocolate biscuits. Actually, oh yeah, sugar, <laughs> plenty of sugar and caffeine. Sugar and caffeine. <laughs> necessary is my final top tip but absolutely support your comment of you know sometimes you've just got to start you've just got to do it you've just got to get a first chunk out of the way and then and then it will flow but you've just got to got to do it really having had your coffee and chocolate biscuit we're, we're, we're not food police so we swear <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. okay are we there then? Any any final questions, thoughts? No. All right. Um, great. Thank you, everybody. Um, Andrea, shall I just hand over to you to, to wrap things up? Um, I, I, just a final thank you to everybody, and especially David and Heather for giving up their time for free today. We really appreciate it. Um, no matter how much experience you've had, there's always more to learn, and I've got something out of today as well. So it's been great meeting you. If you have any, ref we'll send out uh, a feedback form, but if you have any thoughts on reflection about particular areas of support you have, we've got a great team here, and that's what we're here for. So do get in touch. Thank you, David and Heather. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank it's you. our pleasure. Thank you. Really nice yeah. to meet you all and best of luck uh, with your future and what, what you're doing. Great stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.
Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.